In our headlines on this Tuesday afternoon, August 9th, at least seven people have been killed following a torrential downpour in the Greater Seoul area, which has triggered flash floods and power outages. President Sagyal has urged for efforts to ease supply to people as more record rain is in the forecast. Foreign Minister Park Jin is in China, having arrived there late Monday at the invitation of his counterpart Wang Yi to address South Korea's ties with its biggest trading partner. The two diplomats will sit down for talks later on this Tuesday in the city of Qingdao. And the ruling People Power Party is transitioning from its current one-person leadership to an emergency committee arrangement with the final steps being taken on this Tuesday, despite strong opposition from its suspended chairman. We start with scenes from Pampo Hangang Park behind me, which was pounded by heavy rain last night as the central part of the country saw record rainfall that triggered much chaos. In fact, the Central Disaster and Safety Countermeasure Headquarters has in place a level three warning to prevent further damage. And my colleague Ishihu joins me live with details on that and more, of course. Shihu, do start us off then. Hello, Sunny. I'm out here on the road to the Tamsu Bridge, where the I'm leading up to Tamsu Bridge, located in central Seoul. Now, the bridge has been closed off due to heavy downpours last night. The water level, as you can see behind me, have risen, leading to closure. Now, this is the second time the bridge has been closed off this year due to heavy rain since June 30th. And while the rain is pouring, it's still not as heavy as it was last night. At times during the night, parts of the capital area received more than 100 millimeters of rain on average, while some districts like Dongjakgu received up to a whopping 422 millimeters of rain. In response, heavy rain warnings have been issued for most central regions and Gangwon-do and Chungcheong-do provinces. Right, Shu, I also hear the flash floods have also led to losses of lives here in the capital region. Could you tell us more? Sunny, unfortunately, at least eight have been confirmed dead and six are missing. And almost 400 have been displaced from their homes and have taken shelter in local gyms and schools. And there's been a lot of damage reported as well. Roads, underpasses and buildings have been flooded. And operation of Seoul's Express Line 9 has been suspended and stations on lines 2, 3 and 7 have been submerged. Some parts of the city's highways are also expected to see restrictions. Already, Olympic Highway and the Dongbu and Nabu Expressways are blocked. But there isn't as much rain during the day, with an average of 30 millimeters per hour. Seoul is seeing lighter rain, while southern Gyeonggi regions like Suwon, Busan, and Pyeongtaek are seeing a bit more. Starting in the late afternoon, though, conditions will get more serious, with rain more like what we saw last night. Tonight, up to around 100 to 200 millimeters of rain will fall in the capital region, but some areas could even see up to 300 millimeters. And to minimize any further damage, authorities are advising people to stay away from streams and rivers that are prone to flooding. They should also refrain from visiting mountainous regions where there is a risk of land size. Also, those going out should use public transportation rather than driving. That's all I have for now. Back to you, Sunny. All right, Chiu, thank you for that live coverage of the repercussions resulting from the recent rainfall here in the metropolitan region. And now for more on what lies ahead with regard to the torrential downpour, I turn to our weather forecaster, Che Jian, who is standing by at the weather center. Chian, what can you tell us? Hi, Sunny. Unfortunately, dire weather conditions are not getting any better. Unprecedented rain in Seoul led to power outages, road closures, and major travel disruptions. The rain has temporarily weakened, but it's still falling on and off. But don't get too settled as Seoul, Gyeonggi-do, Gangwon-do, and even parts of Chungcheong-do provinces are all under heavy rain alerts. And the bulk of the heavy rain, up to 350 millimeters, will be pounding down in and around the Seoul metropolitan area and inland Gangwon-do province until Thursday. And 300 millimeters is also expected in Chungcheong-do and Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces. So be careful of landslides and flush flooding as they can occur suddenly without warning. And get ready to evacuate immediately if necessary. Let's hope there's no more damage and keep yourself alert wherever you are. That's all for me for now and back to you Sunny. 
Right, Chian, thank you for that update. Also, in related news, President Yoon so gyal has urged for a comprehensive response strategy to the record rainfall here in the metropolitan region. Speaking at an emergency meeting earlier on this Tuesday, Yoon called for all out efforts to protect people and property by taking appropriate preventative measures. He also shared words of condolences and comfort with regard to losses incurred amid the downpours and thanked officials for working around the clock to better respond to the situation. Now, as Archian mentioned, another catastrophic consequence of record rainfall can be landslides. And in this next report, our Isung Jie provides us with some potential precursors. Do take a look. A massive landslide can be seen wiping out trees. This is the site of an apartment complex located in Kaje, Gyeongsangnam-do province in September 2020. The apartment complex was built after excavating the side of a hill but the area was not designated as being at risk from landslides. A large rock fell, and then every 10 minutes there was a landslide before trees began falling. This is a village where a landslide occurred after 350 millimeters of rain fell in a two-day period last year. Due to the construction of housing nearby, there were fears that a landslide would occur. When there is torrential rain during the night, a landslide could occur as soon as early morning. While landslides are hard to prevent, experiments show that good observation of mountains can reduce damage. An experiment mimicked the effects of 50 millimeters of rain per hour being applied to terrain with an inclination of 35 degrees. This caused the area to break up, and a landslide was observed after just 10 hours. It's important to see if there are any rocks rolling down or cracks on the slopes, as that could be the early signs of a landslide. And if you spot trees tilted despite there being no strong winds present, a landslide could occur in the area. There are other signs of landslides people should watch out for. These include large amounts of water gushing down slopes, or if you hear tremors or the sound of moving earth. Such signs could mean that sloped areas are on the brink of collapsing, and hasty evacuation is needed. It's also important to know that landslides can occur even in cities. When it rains, also check the latest information from the Korea Forest Service and no evacuation routes and sites in advance. Also, when evacuating, shut off gas and electricity to prevent secondary damage from fire. Lee seung Arirang News. In other news, health authorities here have announced close to 150,000 new COVID-19 infections on this Tuesday. The surge in daily tally comes amid the greater number of testings on Monday as compared to the day prior and marks the highest in about four months. Authorities believe South Korea may hit, that is, the peak of this latest wave in late August. They also recorded 40 more losses of lives and have 364 patients in critical care. Over in China, Foreign Minister Park Jin and his counterpart Wang Yi are scheduled to sit down for talks later on this Tuesday. And high on the agenda are semiconductors. Our Kim Dami reports. Tsar is going to take part in the so-called Chip 4, the Washington-led semiconductor alliance aimed at cooperation in chip supply chains. South Korea's top diplomat Park Jin made clear her stance speaking to reporters on Monday before he left for China for talks with his Chinese counterpart Wang Yi the next day. The alliance is not meant to exclude any particular country, so I will go over and discuss these various issues with China. This is very much in line with what South Korean President Yoon suk yeol said earlier in the day, that each ministry is looking closely into the matter from the perspective of the national interest. Despite her repeated emphasis on South Korea's national interest, Beijing sees the pact as nothing more than a grouping aimed at countering its influence in global supply chains. Details are yet to come out, but the first such meeting of the Chief Four, also involving Taiwan and Japan, could take place as soon as the latter part of this month or early next month. Buck has a lot on his plate during his three-day visit to Qingdao, in particular the escalating U.S.-China tensions over Taiwan. While reiterating his support for the One China principle, the top diplomat stressed that China is well aware that peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait is essential to security and prosperity on the Korean Peninsula. His trip comes ahead of the two countries, the 30th anniversary of bilateral ties on August 24th. So Bak will also be looking to expand the cultural exchanges like K-pop and K-dramas, particularly among young people. Kim Dami, 
à l'Iran News. Back on the local front, the government will share tangible measures this week to better contain the cost of living ahead of the Chuseok holiday, which falls in early September this year. Our finance ministry correspondent, Om ji explains. South Korea's consumer prices this year are likely to hover around 5 percent, with the average rate of inflation from January to July hitting 4.9 percent. Given this backdrop, Finance Minister Chu kyung ho said at an emergency economic meeting on Monday that the government will announce measures this week to stabilize people's livelihoods ahead of the Chuseok holiday. This will be on top of the measures announced earlier, including giving subsidies to farmers and providing tariff exemptions on some imported food products. Chu also said he'll seek for ways to resolve the difficulties that firms are experiencing. To revitalize the private sector, the government will quickly resolve any difficulties that companies are facing, including in terms of regulations, finding funding, as well as labor shortages. He added that there have been labor shortages in key industries, including shipbuilding and the services and agricultural sectors, because of a rise in demand for labor in the service industry following the lifting of social distancing measures and a delay in allowing foreign laborers into the country due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The government will increase the quota for foreign employees and issue E-9 visas more quickly for non-Korean laborers in August. The government will swiftly let 42,000 foreign laborers come to South Korea who couldn't enter the country from 2020 to first half of this year. Also, steps will be taken to let an additional 21,000 foreign employees enter the country quickly in the second half of this year. Also, the government will sell public assets that are not being used effectively in order to further boost the economy. Om ji Arirang News. On the political front, the ruling People Power Party is now poised to transition into an emergency leadership framework. It's holding a two-stage virtual national committee meeting today with some 700 participants. Now, during the first session earlier this morning, members approved a revision to a party rule to enable an acting chair to appoint an interim leader, not only when the party chair is vacant, but also in the case of a suspension. The second session follows this afternoon to vote on the appointment of the interim leader. Now, in between the two sessions, the party will also host a general meeting during which its central leadership will nominate the interim leader. Five-term PPP lawmaker Chu Ho-young, who previously served as floor leader and acting chair, is the primary candidate. If all goes according to plan on this Tuesday, Chairman Lee Jun-sok, who is currently suspended over a sexual bribery allegation, automatically loses his post. And that ends part one of the Daily Report. We return with part two in a few minutes. Stay with us. Extraordinary climate crisis pledged to work with the EU to tackle the challenge. Protesters gathering across the country to peacefully demand an end to hate and violence. Arika, what matters?
Welcome back. South Korea is reportedly the only developed country where the act of tattooing is outlawed unless you're a medical doctor. Now, for more on this reality and its comparison to countries elsewhere, I have Jack Barton here in the studio. Jack, welcome back. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. I also have Gerlind Volmer at Deutsche Welle, live on the line. Gerlind, it's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you for having me. All right, Jack, we'll start here in the studio. Late last month, the Constitutional Court here upheld its earlier ruling against tattooing by those who do not have a medical degree. Perhaps we can start with a bit of background information regarding this particular ruling, that is, for our viewers who join us from abroad. In a legal sense, it begins back in 1992 when the Supreme Court ruled that while tattooing would be allowed, it was a medical practice. This actually followed a precedent set in Japan and South Korea followed that probably because it was a way to enact a ban without actually calling it a ban because of course 99.9% .9 of doctors have no interest at all in doing tattoos and they're certainly not going to set up a tattoo gun and ink in the corner of their, their clinic. So it's not a ban but it is a ban. Then in 2016 there was a challenge. Uh, we saw at that time it was seven judges to two voting in favour of upholding this ban and then earlier in the year we saw another challenge uh, by tattooists and we saw a narrower margin of five judges voting to uphold it against four judges so we're seeing that and then last month uh, upholding but a, a redefinition again stating that while the judges say uh, you know it doesn't treat or prevent any disease it represents a public health risk and this is why they say it still has to be carried out by medical practitioners japan dropped or overturned its ruling back in 2020 so as you mentioned yeah south korea now the only developed nation in the world where it's still illegal to give someone a tattoo right and gerlin for the sake of comparison could you tell us a bit about the law governing tattooing over there in germany Yes, yeah, so my, my answer could be rather short because there is um, really nearly none, but there are some things. So the, the first thing is that um, mostly you have to be um, grown up, so you have to be 18, or if you're underage, you need to have a written um, statement by your parent that they are okay with you uh, getting tattooed, but most tattoo studios only tattoo people over 18. And then um, the other thing is I could, if I don't want to be a journalist anymore, I could tomorrow go to uh, register my business and open a tattoo studio because there's nearly no regulation. I need a health certificate and then I can buy a tattoo machine or buy me a bamboo stick and start. And it, it's really not regulated. So um, uh, even in the tattoo scene, some things say, okay, they are black sheep and uh, good tattoo st studios try to do... Um, sort of education by themselves so they they take young people and say okay you can practice on a sort of artificial skin and you do an internal exam because there are no state exams and um, the only thing the only ruling um, who has just come into practice uh, this uh, january uh, 2020 is a um, european union ruling in uh, is a prohibition of um, colors because uh, most colors, um, they have chrome or nickel or copper inside and those uh, chemical substances uh, can harm your um, health, can cause allergies and they're also under suspicion to cause cancer. So the European Union uh, did um, prohibit all those colors and asked the tattoo industry perhaps to develop other colors, uh, which are, well, all these ingredients are not inside. So for the moment, uh, in uh, Germany, all the uh, European Union, it's only black, white, and gray tattoos which are allowed. And if you want to have a colorful tattoo, you have to go outside uh, European Union, for instance, to the UK, who recently just left the European Union. Right, I see. And Jack, in comparison, then, how do you explain the overall sense of reservation with regard to tattooing or tattoos here in the country that is amid the older generation as opposed to their younger counterparts? Well, I think we've all been through this in other countries. It's just we've been through it a bit earlier. You know, my grandparents would have been appalled at tattoos. Or, but in South Korea, well, in Korea, you know, tattoos have a long tradition, but they're a completely negative tradition. So even a thousand years ago, we saw the only people who got 
tattoos at the time were criminals who had their tattoos either tattooed on their arm, uh, had their crimes tattooed on their arm or their face, and slaves. And then in more recent modern times, it's been crime gangs who identify themselves with their gangs through tattoos. And these are really the only people in society who had tattoos. And so when you saw it, there was always a negative connotation. And even today, if we're watching the news and we see uh, uh, someone being brought down to the court and they have tattoos, the camera will always zoom in as if to say, look at this, this is clearly a bad person, they have tattoos. And that, so we're seeing that very strongly amongst the older generation, but of course amongst the younger generation, the 20-somethings, the people who really want to get tattoos, that's all changing. They're watching media from all around the world and they see for people their age everywhere, it's essentially normal now. The latest Gallup poll for people in their 20s here, I think 80% supported overturning this ban. If you make that a general, uh, the Gallup poll, I think it was around 50%. So you see that it's really the younger generation is very much for overturning uh, this ruling, while the older generation, for all of those reasons stated before, is still very reluctant. They see it as taboo, as, as stigmatising. Right, they do. Curly, does a foreign journalist then, observing the events unfolding here in South Korea beyond, uh, from, national, from beyond national borders, that would be, what are your personal thoughts on the debate here with regard to tattooing? Yeah, to, to be honest, I was very astonished because uh, I'm not a South Korean specialist. I even didn't know that there is a country where um, tattoos are not common because if you go here through Berlin, you see even we have summer now, so people show more or less um, body parts. So you see more tattoos coming up. Um, and sometimes in some areas, for instance, if you go in a concert, you really feel nearly naked if you have no tattoo because everyone is tattooed. And also you see more tattoos coming up in, in areas when before no one had tattoos like even on the um, skin of your uh, of your face or of your um, upper body and um, so uh, I'm, I'm kind of astonished but um, I can understand this in line with this color decision which we had uh, recently in the European Union and I see that um, the state might also uh, protect its people against um, potential health risks so um, I can understand this and um, but, but I think also, like, uh, finally, it's a personal decision. So um, for the sake of personal freedom, I can imagine that everyone should decide himself, but should be really, um, people should really uh, explain what kind of risks are behind. And um, so I, I would say uh, from, a, from our German point of view, um, I really can't uh, understand the discussion. It was very interesting what Jack was saying before, where tattoos historically come from, because it was the same in Europe. But um, it was prison inmates and, and some uh, marine uh, people working on ships. But this is really the past. This is like 50 years ago. And then it gradually developed. So in the 90s, there was one tattoo, a tribal tattoo in the upper back, which many, many people had. And now it's uh, other figures in style. And, and, and young people, if you ask like uh, pupils, students in school, do you want a tattoo? Most of them say yes. And, and they're really thinking, how can they express their personality with a tattoo? And uh, yeah, so it's for me, it's um, perhaps sort of, I can understand it for the health risks, but for me, it's sort of behind. Right. You just reminded me of something my daughter was telling her father. that She'd like to have a tattoo of a, a butterfly on her hand <laughs> or something. He was completely appalled, as you said. Now, Jack, what look to be the broader implications of limiting the practice of tattooing to the medical arena, do you think? Well, the medical profession is actually supporting, uh, you know, this position. Most of them say it is a public health risk and they are backing it. But really, the overall effect is just to keep it underground, which is where it is at the moment. The conservative estimate here. The, the lowest number is that there are 50,000 illegal tattoo artists in South Korea and that about a million South Koreans have a tattoo. So, you know, you're pushing it underground, you're ensuring there are no health and safety standards. So, you know, if there is no licensing, if there is no process, then it's, it, it's really the Wild West out there. Um, and also, you know, they face the very real threat of prosecution by the law. There are several tattoo artists 
doing a, a roughly two-year jail sentences, big fines. We saw recently an artist who has even tattooed people like Brad Pitt, hit with a huge fine because he was tattooing a Korean actor on YouTube, where, of course, it was in the public domain. So, really, the only effect is not going to stop it. You know, so many people have tattoos. There are so many tattoo um, artists out there. It just ensures there are no regulations. There are no health and safety out there. And I've heard that even in the very few medical practices where it is conducted, they sneakily bring in illegal tattoo artists because, yes, doctors know about sterilising needles, but what do they know about doing a beautiful rose on someone's back? Absolutely nothing. Right, I see. And now, against this backdrop, a team of researchers at the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology have developed tattoos that can serve as health monitoring devices. For more on this, I have the head of that team, Professor Steve Park at KAIST, live on the line. Professor Park, it's a pleasure to have you with us. Thanks for having me. Right, so Professor, do tell us a bit about this innovative application of tattoos as developed by your team. So our tattoo ink is uh, made up of a material called uh, liquid metal uh, combined with uh, carbon nanotubes. And the uh, distinguishing feature of our tattoo ink is that it, it is stretchable, uh, conductive, and when applied to the epidermis, uh, it dries very quickly. And also, it's very uh, durable, so it doesn't uh, rub off very easily. Uh, and lastly, it's also very biocompatible, meaning it's uh, very safe to uh, use. Uh, and what we showed with this tattoo is that uh, we can detect various uh, biosignals coming from uh, the body. For instance, we can measure ECG. Uh, we also made uh, biosensors to detect biomarker markers in sweat. And also, we made heaters for uh, pain treatment uh, purposes. Uh, and lastly, the, the distinguishing feature of using tattoos as a health monitoring device compared to that of the traditional wearable devices, which are typically a uh, patch type. Uh, they, the, uh, the bad thing about patch type is that they are relatively uncomfortable to the user. Uh, but our tattoo, if you, if you use tattoo, what so the user has a much more comfortable time uh, basically having it on. Uh, they don't really feel it. And also you can easily uh, wash it off just with soap. So that makes it much more convenient uh, for the user. Right, I see. Now, Professor Park, I understand your re research itself is still in its very early stages, of course. And what are some of the tasks then that lie ahead? So the current issues that still need to be solved is firstly, we have to integrate a uh, computer chip uh, in, with the tattoo so that we can communicate wirelessly uh, to an external device so that the, the whatever signal that we're getting from the body can be received uh, by an external device like our smartphone or our, our, our computer. Also, we are uh, trying to enable motion detecting capability using our tattoo. So that would add another layer of uh, health monitoring uh, to our tattoo and also we can potentially uh, enable metaverse applications where a person's motion can be replicated uh, in a virtual world. So I think the, there are many different uh, possibilities with our uh, tattoo technology. Right. Moving forward, Professor Park, do you suppose the uh, potential adoption of your technology perhaps will serve to shift the general public perception about tattoos here in South Korea? Yes, so I think tattoos are already being uh, integrated uh, slowly into the Korean society. You can tell that by the number of people with tattoos compared to how it was uh, back then in the past. I think that my technology will give uh, functionality to tattoos. So instead of the tattoos uh, being solely for the purpose of expressing oneself artistically, but it can also serve a particular purpose. For example, your tattoo can now be used as a uh, health monitoring uh, device. So I think in that sense, the society can uh, accept tattoos uh, more broadly just uh, with the implementation of my technology. Right, I see. All right, Professor Park, thank you so much for making the time to join us live with your thoughts and best of luck in your future endeavors. Thank you for having me.
Right then, here in the studio again, Gerland actually, staying with public perception, I hear one German hotel chain, I believe, has been promoting a tattoo campaign to recruit workers amid, of course, a severe shortage in labor. Gerland, could you tell us a bit more about this? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I had uh, I also saw the uh, campaign. So um, I think this has to do with COVID because uh, uh, in the COVID time, all the hotels and restaurants had uh, to close. Now it's gradually opening up or has been more or less open up here in Germany. And there's a, a big labor charges because in the time of COVID, people um, just uh, went elsewhere or find other jobs or open their own business. And so uh, this is a, a hotel uh, group who wants to be very hip and, and being in a big city. And this has to do with also what Jack uh, was telling before. In, um, I think it's a general trend all over, not only in Korea, but also here in Germany, that tattoos are seen something of uh, fancy people, hip people, in, uh, inside people. And so this um, hotel say, OK, if you stay with us for six months, we pay you a two, two, tattoo, which is worth 500 euros. And uh, like if you want to have a tattoo, a small tattoo saying like a little rose or a little uh, animal, uh, which is perhaps as big as the palm of your hand, the average price here in Germany is 100 to 200 uh, euros, depending to which tattoo studio you go. So if you get 500 euros, you can do like a bigger one or, uh, or perhaps several ones. So, And um, uh, this uh, hotel um, chain, I think they want to distinguish themselves, saying we're cool people, you can come with us. You're not staying in an, a sort of um, aseptic environment. You're with, there with friends, you'll have fun. You, they have also bar with this 24 hours open, but there's no restaurant. So this is a, they want to have young, young hip, uh, urban um, clients and, and they want to distinguish themselves from others. So uh, it's an interesting um, idea, but perhaps also born a little bit out of desperation. Hmm. And Gerda, what do you suppose has been the uh, response, the public response that is to that particular hotel's tattoo campaign? Um, it has not really been outstanding because tattoos, uh, as I said earlier, but perhaps my perception is also a little bit biased because I'm living in Berlin where, where many people are tattooed. Like in the average, every 10th German has a tattoo and every uh, um, has um, uh, several tattoos and 14% uh, of Germans have a tattoo. And I think the uh, density of tattoos here in Berlin is just much higher than if you would go to a conservative um, area, perhaps in, in the south of Germany. Uh, so, um, yeah, people accept it. It's, yes, why not? So, um, and for, for some reasons, like if you're a musician, people really expect you to have a tattoo. But if you're perhaps a judge or a lawyer or a, a bank clerk, then you can have a tattoo, but perhaps you should have a long sleeve shirt. So it, it didn't make big, big waves, but it's a, it just a, sort of a marketing gag. So, yeah, I don't know. It's perhaps not a gag, but it's an interesting um, approach to, to seek uh, personal. Right. Back here in uh, South Korea, Jack, there is a campaign, an online campaign, actually, uh, led by those in the tattooing industry field, so to speak, to legalize uh, tattoo here in South Korea. That being said, in your opinion, is tattooing perhaps a form of artistic expression or do you believe that it should be a medical uh, practice? as um, ruled by the Constitutional Court here? There should be some health and safety oversight. And I think in a lot of countries, say Australia, the United States, you have to go through rigorous health and safety training. Um, you also have to do specific uh, needle safety training, sanitization. Uh, you have to do hundreds of hours of apprenticeship. And there's lots of hoops you have to go through to be certified. So, you know, clearly there is that side of it. And you want to have a nice artistic tattoo. Most people do, not everybody. So there's the artistic side. But I think the big thing is just youthful angst or the passion of youth. When you're in your 20s, when you're in your 30s, you're trying to uh, step away from the previous generation or perhaps uh, separate yourself from the mainstream or in places where everybody, all your friends, has a tattoo. And it is the mainstream. It's about establishing yourself within that social framework. So I, you know, I think it's just about being young and about being expressing yourself. And that rolls through into the 30s. And after that, yes, some people still do get tattoos, but you see a big drop off and often they're covering up the old tattoos they're a bit embarrassed about getting when they were 21 or perhaps having some of them removed. So yeah, look, it's, a, it's an expression of youth. And on top of that, there is an artistic side and there should be a health and safety side. Right, of course. Gerland, what do you propose to perhaps bridge the gap of the differences here in South Korea with regard to tattooing? 
Yeah, I, I would think perhaps something in the, in the middle. I, I'm not in a position to uh, propose something to the constitutional, constitutional court of uh, South Korea, but uh, I think uh, if people do it illegally, um, there might be more harm than if it would be controlled and, and you have a, a proper um, sort of education, like how to learn it. And uh, because it's something is, if, if I buy a, a, a suit which doesn't fit me, I can just put it away, but uh, my tattoo will stay with me or, or they have to go to a dermatologist to get it lasered and that's costly and uh, makes uh, uh, much pain or have to have a cover up so uh, better tattoo artists who who will just um, integrate the failed tattoo into a nicer one so that, that's a much thing so i, I think uh, the um, demand there and um, because as we see it is a global phenomenon i don't think that south korea can stay behind that you can isolate people and say okay you can get your tattoo anywhere but not here so i think it would be a wise decision to to get it a, a, a proper framework uh, for artists, artistic, uh, health care, and, and, and then see uh, how to go forward. Right. And Jack, what are your words of advice, perhaps for my husband as well? They've yet to reach a consensus. Yeah, no hands and face and neck, I would say on that. But in general, I agree with Gerlin. You know, it's about compromise. Now, clearly, there's a critical mass of South Koreans who have tattoos. More are getting tattoos. Very soon, it is going to enter the mainstream. Ten years ago, if I saw a young lady walking down the street with tattoos here, I almost stop and what? Uh, now it's just so normal, you know, it, it, it's just becoming a normal sight. I think the next time there is a challenge, if you look at the number of judges who are voting in favour of overturning it, it probably will be overturned and just meet that compromise. So yes, as a tattoo artist, you can work, but you have to go through rigorous health training. You have to do an apprenticeship. You have to be well qualified in your art, not just in the painting side of it, but in the safety side of it as well. But I think it's something that's going to organically happen. Um, you can't turn back on the clock on these things, but yeah, for your daughter, like no hands and <laughs> no feet, no neck, no face. I yeah. will be sure to tell her as well. <laughs> All right, as always, Jack, thank you so much for your time. And Gerlin, thank you very much for your time and your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you. In the U.S., the Biden administration's military support of Ukraine's fight against Russian invasion continues. The latest aid is worth one billion U.S. dollars and brings the total sum of security assistance thus far to about 90 billion U.S. dollars. Our Kim hyo has more. Washington has announced that it will send an additional one billion U.S. dollars in security assistance to Ukraine amid ongoing Russian military action. The Pentagon explained Monday that the new package will include new shipments of ammunition, equipment and weapons, as well as medical supplies. It comes on the heels of another $550 million worth of military aid to Ukraine announced earlier this month. Since the war began in February, the Biden administration has committed around $9 billion in security assistance to Ukraine. The latest announcement comes as heavy fighting continues in eastern and southern Ukraine, with Russian missile strikes also killing citizens across the country. Against this backdrop, Ukraine has stressed that it will liberate areas captured by Moscow. Ukraine must regain everything Russia has temporarily captured, and the aggressor state must receive punishment for the crimes of aggression. Meanwhile, Russia and Ukraine traded accusations on Monday that each side is shelling Europe's largest nuclear power plant located in southern Ukraine. The UN chief warned that the shelling over the weekend of the Zaporizhia nuclear power station, which was captured by Moscow early in the war, could be, quote, suicidal. He also called for international inspectors to be given access to the site. These latest developments come amid reports that confirm over 450 foreign-made parts have been found in Russian weapons recovered in Ukraine. According to research by a defense think tank, Royal United Services Institute, this serves as evidence that Moscow acquired critical technology from companies based in the U.S., Europe and Asia before the invasion. Kim Hyo-san, Arirang News. 
Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden has voiced concern over China's show of military might around Taiwan, but believes Beijing will not take additional measures to further raise tensions. Now, the remarks were made in response to questions from reporters Monday that also included an inquiry regarding his thoughts on whether it was wise for U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to have traveled to Taiwan. Now, to this... Biden's response was cut, claiming it was her decision. China, for its part, has suspended defense talks with the U.S., as well as bilateral climate talks, and sanctioned Pelosi and her immediate family. And this week, South Korea's defense forces are partaking in an extensive U.S.-led military training session in Hawaii aimed at deterring the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Our Payunji has details. The U.S. Department of State announced Monday local time that it's hosting the Fortune Guard 22 in Honolulu, Hawaii, from Monday through Friday. It added that it'll hold live exercises to demonstrate weapons of mass destruction interdiction capabilities. 21 countries, including South Korea, the U.S., and Japan, will engage in a wide range of related activities, from whole-of-government rapid decision-making to operational interdiction, seizure, and disposition. During the drill, they will also share information on a chemical, biological and nuclear response. The exercise will also feature expert briefs and a scenario-based tabletop discussion. The PSI exercise is a drill aimed at preventing the illegal proliferation of weapons of mass destruction and related materials. As for South Korea, the Ministry of Defense is jointly taking part in the exercise, along with relevant ministries, including the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Korea Coast Guard. The latest exercise is part of the Proliferation Security Initiative, or PSI, established in 2003 by the U.S., to stop or impede transfers of weapons of mass destruction and related items flowing to and from states and non-state actors of proliferation concern. The U.S. initiated Asia-Pacific PSI exercises in 2014. Participating countries have also hosted their own exercises, like Eastern Endeavor in South Korea, Pacific Shield in Japan, and Pacific Protector in Australia. Peunz, Arirang News. On the local front, South Korea's railroad operator has run a promising test of a new massive freight train that looks to prop up its revenue. Our Eunjin reports. Coming out of the tunnel is a train of cargo cars pulled by two electric locomotives at the head. Its heftiness makes surrounding vehicles and even other trains look miniature. This train connecting 50 cargo-only cars is being called the Grand Cargo Train. Reaching 777 meters in length, that's about twice the length of the KTX passenger train, which is 388 meters. A successful test run of the Grand Cargo Train traveled 402.3 kilometers from Obong Station in Uiwang City, Gyeonggi-do Province, to Busan Shinhang Station. The cargo cars carried actual export goods and parts, like electronics and car parts that the cargo train would actually be used to transport once it becomes commercialized. CoRail said they pushed for the launch of this cargo train as they hoped to reverse their annual loss of more than some 152.8 million U.S. dollars in logistics. Cargo trains that have been in operation have 33 cars, and expanding the train to 50 cars is expected to improve transportation capacity by 52%. This train will contribute greatly to resolving our logistics deficit issue. Increasing the efficiency of cargo trains will play a major role in reducing CoRail's death ratio. CoRail will analyze results from the test operation and make any necessary improvements with the goal of putting the grand cargo train into commercialized operation by the first half of 2023. Ian Jin, Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. In Cuba, a major fire at an oil storage facility has spread to a third oil tank. Heading into its fourth day, the deadly blaze ignited a third oil storage tank on Monday. This comes after one of the eight storage tanks at the large oil facility in the Cuban city of Matanzas caught fire after being struck by lightning on Friday local time. 
At least one person has been killed and 125 injured, while dozens of emergency workers are reported missing. The blaze has created a massive cloud of smoke and dangerous substances. Local officials have warned residents to use face masks or stay indoors. A fourth tank is now at risk, but officials say it has not yet caught fire. Cuba is being assisted by Mexico and Venezuela through special firefighting teams armed with water cannons, planes and helicopters in a bid to tackle the blaze. Following three days of conflict, the ceasefire on Sunday between Israel and Palestinian militants appears to be holding. The ceasefire has led to the resumption of Gaza's only power plant on Monday, alongside the reopenings of crossings from Israel into Gaza. Israel said the crossings reopened to allow for humanitarian needs, adding that a full reopening will follow if the calm continues. The opened passage has seen fuel trucks head to the power plant. Residents of Gaza only have a few hours of power per day as the territory is under an Israeli-Egyptian blockade. The latest fighting in the area started on Friday when Israel launched what it called a preemptive strike on militants from the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, who fired hundreds of rockets at Israel in return. Infectious diseases may be getting worse as a result of increasing climate hazards. This is according to a study published on Monday in the Nature Climate Change Journal. It suggested that 218 of 375 human infectious diseases, or 58 percent, have been made worse by 10 types of extreme weather connected to climate change. These include flooding, heat waves and drought, which influence the spread of diseases like malaria, hantavirus, cholera and anthrax. Disease-carrying animals increased infections in people after floods, while warming oceans taint seafood. The study also showed that climate hazards appear to worsen 223 of 286 non-infectious illnesses, such as asthma and allergies. Singer and actor Olivia Newton-John has died at the age of 73. Her death was announced by her family Monday and comes after she battled bouts of breast cancer over 30 years. The Australian-born celebrity is best known for her iconic role as Sandy in the 1978 hit musical film Grease. Co-star John Travolta has posted a tribute to Newton-John, noting that she made everyone's lives better. Newton-John revealed a cancer diagnosis at the base of her spine in September 2018. She had breast cancer in the 90s and then again in 2017. Matthew Ashley, Arirang News. Good Tuesday afternoon. Deadly downpours in Seoul last night devastated the whole city. The rain has temporarily weakened, but it's still on and off. So don't get too settled as Seoul, Gyeonggi-do, Gangwon-do, and even parts of Chungcheong the provinces are all under heavy rain alerts. And the bulk of the heavy rain, up to 350 millimeters, will be concentrated in and around the Seoul metropolitan area and parts of Gangwon-do province. And 300 millimeters for northern parts of Chungcheong-do and Gyeongsangbuk-do provinces. Now, landslide alerts and flood warnings are in place, so please keep yourself alert in order to avoid experiencing a catastrophic disaster. While looking at today's high temperatures, it's relatively cooler in central regions. But heat alerts continue in southern regions, reaching 34 degrees in Taegu. And we have rain in the forecast throughout this week, and it's going to expand nationwide from Thursday. So please stay safe wherever you are. Now, let's take a look at the worldwide weather conditions.
And those are the headlines at this hour. For those of you here in the capital region, do take care against the rain. Thank you for watching. See you on Wednesday.